Hi, I'm Dick Singh. This issue is covering doors. Now, I normally don't do doors on the lathe, but those doors do need a means of being opened. Now, that's where our lathe is going to come into effect. Uh, I've got a few different knobs, um, a handle or two, and we can take and discuss different ways of making those knobs unique. This one is used with chatter work, which adds a little ornamentation to it. Here is one that I think is quite neat. I don't know if you can see it, but the inlay around the outside is actually a raised bead. Not much, about a 30 second, but when you really look at it close, it's very unique. Plus it has a contrasting inlay on the inside. This one, again it has the inlay, but that inlay hides something. This one has a threaded insert on the inside. Sooner or later you're going to have something that's going to present you a problem as to how to mount it, or maybe you want a little extra strength in it. That'll help. One of the other things, I don't know if you've noticed, but I have a an embossment around that. My feelings, every time I've had a knob on a, on a door or a drawer and the screw loosens up, the handle or the knob moves back and forth and seems to scratch the door. By putting a raised embossment on here, all you have to do is drill a, a shallow hole concentric to your screw hole and it will help lock that knob into your drawer and keep it solid. This also is going to help us turn our knobs on the lathe. Sooner or later, I'm sure you're going to want to make a handle. They're kind of neat. Again, you can do whatever you need to take and bring out whatever design option you need for whatever you're building. Sooner or later you're going to want to take and make a knob that has a lot of strength to it. Rather than using a screw, we're going to use a bolt and a propel nut. This is a propel nut. Around the edges of the shank is its grabbing feature versus the spurs on a T-nut. Now, a T-nut is good in some respects as long as you don't split what you're trying to drive it into. Uh, the propel nuts work quite fine, and I'm going to use one of those. Um, also, we're going to put in an inlay, which I have the outline or the outer inlay versus the inside, and a piece of maple to make the knob out of. I put my blank into the chuck. Uh, blank size dictates by what you want for a knob. Uh, this particular one, what I'm using is probably an inch and three quarters square by roughly two inches long. Again, this is only necessary for what you want for a size. First, I'm going to reduce this to a diameter. Okay, we've turned it round. Now, this particular one that I'm going to do is going to be used with a propel nut. If I was going to put a screw in it, at this point, I would drill that hole and run a screw in it. I would make my shoulder well, let me go ahead and make sure that I do that properly so that you can understand. Okay, I've turned my little shoulder 5 eighths diameter by roughly 90 thousandths deep. 
at this point I would drill my hole, run my screw into it, make sure that this surface is flat, which goes up against the drawer, and possibly start forming my knob. In other words, I would take and reduce my foot down to whatever diameter I want. This one takes care of the normal knob. I am going to take and put a propel nut in here, so I'm going to have to do an extra step or two. So I'm going to stop at this point on this particular style. I've turned my diameter, and at this point I'm going in and face off the end. I want to keep it relatively flat because it's going to help locate in the chuck forming. When we turn this around, we're going to need a flat surface to set in our jaws, which will help keep everything concentric. The bottom of my jaws are flat, and I've made sure that the screws are recessed slightly below the jaws. That makes the jaws nice and flat where I can put my workpiece against them and retighten everything down. Now normal means of holding in a chuck you can either take and have the face of the jaw hitting a shoulder or setting in the bottom. In this case I just need that to set in the bottom. The jaws grip concentrically but you do need something to keep it from coming up and down being flat on the jaws will help keep that from happening. Everything is running pretty true. I'm going in and cut this out. This is the point of where we're going to start drilling, just so you know where this piece is located. In other words, this is going to be the top where our inlay will go. I have yet to come across a wood lathe that did not have a certain amount of slop in the tailstock. When we go to drill, if we lock this down in its most out of line position, it's going to drill an oversized hole. So what I like to do is allow the drill or the lathe to run, advance it until the tip finds center. Once it has found its center, I lock it down. Now I can go ahead and drill. I'm using a 5 8 Forstner bit, so that's why my lathe is slowed down considerably. And I want to drill my hole roughly 5 8 of an inch from the bottom. Again, this is going to change according to whatever your dimensions are. The propel nut I'm using is a quarter 20 thread and to hold the diameter here it calls for a 5 16 drill. So I'm going to continue drilling that through the entire knob. I faced off this end as I did the other end so when I reverse it I've got a good true surface to go against and now we are in a we are ready to take and install our propel nut our 5 8 diameter just fits and our 5 16 which is going to have to be driven in on count of these lugs and we're all set to do that yeah I like to take it out and set it on a surface that's flat rather than doing it in a chuck Now we've seated our nut. I guess if you wanted you could take and use some epoxy or something to put it in, but I don't really see a good reason why. Everything's going to be pulling against the thread versus pushing against it. Okay, I've reversed our block again. As you can see, our propel nut is at the end, and this is the position that it is in again. Okay, we're going to put our 5 8 boss this onto this piece right now. I 
I've set a calipers a little oversized strictly so that I can go in and and make that a, a real close 5 8 now I do want the bottom to be very flat so at this point I'm gonna straighten that up I'm also going to reduce the size of the foot just to get my proportion so I can see what I'm really doing. Don't forget to chamfer the inside that hole slightly. Okay, now I can start forming my knob so I can see what I really do have. Just making some of my roughed in design. Again, you may want to take and check to see just how much reach or whatever you have designed as a knob. Inside of here is a 5 8 piece of metal. You don't want to make it so thin that that becomes a problem. Now we're going to take it out and reverse it again. Now that we have our knob ready to be reversed again, I've made a little jig. Uh, what it is, is the clearance hole for our quarter 20 and a 5 8 drilled hole that this will set in. When I make my jigs, I always indicate where that jig goes into the lathe. In other words, it goes in the same way every time and it runs true. This is what I'm talking about our boss not only protecting the face of the drawers by not being able to move, but it also sets you up concentric or helps to set you up concentric so you can finish turning the rest of the knob. And yes, we will have a screw through it holding it. We'll put it back in our chuck. Our screw is going to maintain that. Everything is going to run true and we're going to start to form our knob. At this point, I'm just going in and re start making my knob for what I really want. I think right now it's too long. Okay, I think that's pretty much of what I, I want for a shape. At this point, I want to establish what I want for an inlay. I'll just kind of mark it out in pencil. I guess what I'm looking for is something to be proportionate. I would say maybe just a little more. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, now I've got two lines there. This is going to be the outside line, and the inside one is going to be the second inlay. In other words, this little space is going to be a contrasting wood to the other one. Now, whatever size you make really has no effect on, on the inlay until you get to determining what you want for that width of that inlay. Just as an example, let's say that this is an inch and an eighth diameter. If you want a sixteenth, 
band in here, then you have to have the inside one one inch, which is one sixteenth on either side adds up to an eighth or one inch plus an eighth equals one and an eighth. Yeah, I've got what I'm going to put into my knob as my inlays. The white piece of maple is going to be my outer diameter. In other words, that's going to be my accent ring. And I've got a piece of madrona that's going to fit inside of there. When I go to draw these out, I take a me mechanical drawing circle template and I just lay it over what I consider a nice piece of wood such as this, draw my lines out, cut it out on a bandsaw. I've bumped them on my disc sander so I have a good flat surface. I've taken a piece of scrap block and I've got it ready for my chuck. Again, I always mark my scrap blocks because I use them time and time again. This happens to be a piece of maple. Someone's going to tell me why would you use a good piece of maple on a scrap block? Doesn't matter whether it's maple, coca bolo, or whatever. Scrap is scrap. I'm going to take a piece of double face tape and apply it to the faces of our, of our scrap block. I'm going to take my outer ring and position it. Now I'll turn that to my diameter. Now I'm also going to turn a short area onto the scrap block. If we're doing a bunch of knobs, this will make it very easy to do it. I'm checking my diameter to get my inch and an eighth. I like to use a mic, vernier caliper or whatever will work, whatever is your preference. I just find a micrometer very easy to use. I like to use the micrometer for another reason. I want this surface to be very parallel. So I look at the faces of my mic and if everything is laying square to them, my wall is parallel, let alone it also tells me what the exact dimension of that piece is. Right now I'm like a couple thousandths large, which I'm not going to worry about. Now, like I said before, I have cut into my scrap block the same diameter. If I'm doing six knobs, at this point, I would take this one off, I would put the other five on, and this will give me a guide as to how to get to that original diameter by a visual means. What we're going to do now with just this one, I'm going to take my inner inlay and I'm just going to put that on and I'm going to reduce that down and I'm going to make, make that one roughly a hundred thousandths less than my outer inlay. Try and make your cuts as parallel as you can. Okay, this one is almost exactly a hundred thousandths smaller than the other which means I will have a fifty thousandths line around my inner inlay. Okay our next step is back with our knob. We've got it screwed in or held in with the screw so everything's tight to the jig. Again my jig is going back into the the chuck in the same way every time. There is nothing that says that this cannot be drilled for your inlay. If you were using let's say an inch and an eighth Forstner bit, if you made your inlays one and an eighth that's fine. But I find that boring them gives me an unlimited amount of sizes. Drills you're limited to do whatever you have. This allows me to take and do things like making a hundred thousand or a fifty thousand inlay versus a sixteenth. 
the only reason that I bore them. Plus, I do believe I can bore straighter than I can drill. I know that a drill will wander off in the direction of least resistance and I can bore straight. The tool that I'm going to bore with is nothing more than a quarter inch square scraper. Now I have modified it. I've brought the sides in and the front back. That is so that when I go in that the corner does not interfere on the bottom of the tool. In other words, it's just a relief. You'll also notice I'm just a little above center line, which helps me stay away from that wall with that relief also. Let's check our inlay. It's much easier to take a second cut than it is trying to put it back on. Also going to deepen it a little more. I find it very difficult to trust my lines. Fitting always seems to be more of a precision way than, than just going to the line and saying that's it. Be careful that you don't get it so tight you can't get it back out. I'm going to go just a tad deeper. As you can see, your depth of your screw is not really going to matter that much. You're going to have extra room. So if your screw that you're going to install in there is a little longer, it won't much matter. Okay, we're good enough to glue. I'm going to take some medium density super glue and just go around the inside of that hole. Take my inlay and seat it. Seeing how this inlay is going to be relatively small, I want to make sure that it is adhered to the walls very good. So I'm also applying the thin super glue and allowing it to run down the wall. Little accelerator, and we're ready to go again. I'm going to face off the inlay slightly so I can see where, what's really happening. Just take another cut. Okay, let's check it again. We've got it. For you, those of you who think that you could take and sharpen this edge, and go in and use it as a scraper, save yourself a lot of heartache. It's not going to work. You have to pierce it, not, not scrape it. Going to take and run a little bit of the thin stuff around this also, just to make sure that the wall is glued good. A little accelerator, and we're ready to turn. It's time to start leveling off our 
inlay. Using a pull cut. Using a shear cut just to bring this edge around. Do the same on the other side. I kind of like the looks of that. One thing I found with inlays, I like to take and redo the inlay after it's done. In other words, I'm going to give it another coat of glue. I use a piece of polyethylene packing material, stuff they ship electronics in, and I like to use that to spread the glue. This is just to make sure that everything gets down inside all those joints to make sure that I haven't missed anything. And I'm just going to take a sheer cut and come across our glued surface lightly. All I want to do is just clean it up. I like to feel the surface, know if there's a bump in it or not. Going over and do the same on the inside a little bit. And clean up that edge. I think we're ready to sand. Starting with 240 cloth, my feelings are cloth is a coarser grit than what paper is. Always keep your sandpaper moving. This is 400. And my final will be six. Also, a firm believer that you cannot get all the sanding, concentric sanding scratches out with the lathe running, so I always like to stop and finish it by hand at the very end. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit of deft on this. Straight out of the can, I like the semi-gloss or the satin. Allow it to soak up what it will. Take a paper towel and wipe off the excess. And we've got our knob done. We're going to buff this off now. We've got a concentric sewn wheel. And it's a little harder than a loose sewn. So all I want to do is kind of level everything out with this. If you notice, I'm always going at an angle. If there are any scratches, it helps to take them out, rather than going straight on in the same direction that they were put in. But really, you shouldn't be fighting to get scratches out. They should have been taken out when you sanded. Okay, now we're going to move over to the loose wheel. Probably would help if I put a little bit of wax on it. Don't underestimate the pulling power of a buffing wheel. It will take it out of your hands if you're not careful. And here's our completed knob. This one has a threaded insert called the propel nut in it, which gives it strength. We have our boss, which locates it concentric to the whatever screw you're using which help hold it solid in a drawer or a door and no matter how expensive you buy there's nothing like having a 
pull that you've made to the colors that you want and made it to your individual specifications. I'm Dick Singh. Thank you for watching this issue.